Good morning. The Old Testament reading today is from Daniel 9, 4 through 7 and 15 through 19. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, Ah, Lord, a great and awesome God, keeping covenant and steadfast love with those who love you and keep your commandments. We have sinned and done wrong, acted wickedly and rebelled, turned aside from your commandments and ordinances. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Righteousness is not on your side, O Lord, but open shame, as at this day falls on us the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, in all the lands to which you have driven them, because the treachery that they have committed against you. And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt, with a mighty hand made your name renowned, even to this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, in view of all your righteous acts, let your anger and wrath, we pray, turn away from your Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors. Jerusalem and your people have become a disgrace among all your neighbors. Now therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplication. And for your own sake, Lord, let your face shine upon our desolated sanctuary. Incline your ear, O my God, and hear. Open your eyes and look at our desolation and the city that bears your name. We do not present our supplication before you on the ground of our, ground of our righteousness, but on the ground of your greatest mercies. O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, listen and act and do not delay. For your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people bear your name. The New Testament uh, reading is Mark 9, 30 through 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever comes to me and whoever welcomes me welcomes not be me, but the one who sent me. Our last reading for today, the epistle, is 1 Corinthians 14, 26 through 33. What should be done then, my friends? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If anyone speaks a tongue, let there be only two, or at most three, and each in turn let one interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let them be silent in church and speak to themselves and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to someone else sitting nearby, let the first person be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is a God not of disorder, but of peace. The word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord God, 
empty me of me and fill me with you so that the words of my mouth are only yours spoken through me. And Lord, open the ears of the hearers here today that they may hear and listen to what it is you are calling on their hearts to take from this word, your word, into the world. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. With the news of Trump's impeachment hearing and acquittal, the State of the Union Address and Nancy Pelosi's actions being the main focus of media these past weeks, we are witnessing more of the pervasive divisiveness of our society. Both groups who identify as left and right are digging their heels in their ideology <coughs> even deeper. We are seeing more divisive arguments between people when seemingly casual conversations quickly turn into divisive arguments when people's ideologies take front seat. Did you know that according to Harper's Magazine, 78% of the left think the right is too extreme? And 78% of the right think the left is too extreme? Additionally, the majorities of both the left and the right think that their side is losing the war on ideas. So who's right? What do we do when we find our own selves in this unwinnable battle of competing perceptions? Well, in the Gospel of Mark, the passage read today, we see Jesus on answering how his disciples are to act when ideological wars persist and escalate. Jesus recognized how harmful our personal ideologies can be to each one of us. In the opening of this passage, we see the struggle for the disciples because they do not know what to do or say in response to what Jesus was telling them. Twice in this passage, the disciples are silenced after hearing Jesus' words. Their first silence comes after Jesus is, is telling them again about his betrayal, his death, and resurrection. As it states, they did not understand what Jesus was saying. And instead of asking Jesus to clarify, they'd let their societal judgment prevent them from expanding and maturing in their faith. Or, perhaps, their hesitation in asking Jesus to clarify meant that they knew what Jesus was saying, but didn't want to believe it. Sometimes we are silent or overly talkative because we don't want to hear what we fear might change our personal ideology. So the second silence in this passage happens because they are ashamed to answer Jesus' question. What were you arguing about? A question that challenged their ideology. A question that they, in their minds, knew the right answer to, but a response would mean humbly verbalizing a shift in their ideology. You see, what they didn't get, what was Jesus was trying to say, Jesus recognizes that they weren't getting it. And so he continues on explaining. Humbling yourself is what makes you great. Challenging your ideology by acknowledging its flaws and learning from the least of these, the child, the one <coughs> referred to in the scriptures as it. Because in accepting this child as a child of God, we recognize that everyone is a child of God. What Jesus' response recognizes is the main point made by the author of Ecclesiastes when he said, time, there is a time to keep silent and there is a time to speak. Yet it's hard to know when it's time to keep silent and when it's time to speak. Sometimes we talk too much and we find ourselves dominating a conversation which, in which we then block the views of any others in that conversation when we ought to be open to them. 
Other times we remain silent when we should speak out against injustices or evil that we are witnessing. Sometimes we speak when we don't really know what we're talking about. And sometimes we hesitate to speak when we could offer a word of comfort, support, or insight. Jesus knows of this human struggle to go against our beliefs, our core beliefs, and it is evident in his third person reference to himself as the Son of Man. Translations and scholars indicate that when Jesus first refers to himself as the Son of Man, it can be simply understood as him re uh, referring to himself as a fellow human being. It's like being labeled the son of Israel, making you an Israelite. When we look closely at everything Jesus is saying in this passage, we see that he is saying we must be humble and must humble ourselves enough to see every being as a child of God and as a fellow human being made in the image of God. Even Christ was willing to recognize this human struggle in acknowledging all people as a child of God and not by the ideological societal views in the story when he addresses the Canaanite woman. Jesus knows the struggle with personal ideologies and their relationship to societal influence. He knows what the disciples are arguing about here. It is for competition and prestige, a pervasive desire that infected all the cultures of that time and is likely the underlying root cause of the divisiveness in our world today. Apparently, the disciples shared these cultural ideologies that infected everything. Jesus' response, though, flips this cultural value on its head. Jesus says it will be those who do not seek power and prestige that will be seen as great. For in humbling oneself, they can truly get to know who they were created by God to be and become more aware of their role as Christ's disciples. The original disciples knew that they were committed to a life of mirroring Jesus. However, they focused on thinking about their own ideologies, like who will have the glory and power that Jesus possesses. Their ideologies kept them from realizing that this, by accepting this commitment, it meant they are called to a life that is contrary to the world's wisdom that they are called to a life in which the rejected, the low, are lifted up. As Jesus reminds them and us, all who are pretentious are those who will be viewed as great in their resurrection. Finally, the, in the implications from Jesus' response, we recognize that those who humble themselves and welcome those viewed as different are welcoming Christ. Even more importantly, in recognizing everyone as a child of God, we are welcoming God. Now, in viewing this passage, I had remembered a story that I read years ago, and I think it was in one of those Our Daily Bread magazines, but it was about what happened during World War II when Hitler gathered all the religious groups and commanded them to be one so that he could control them. And these brethren assemblies half complied and half refused. Those who went along with the order obviously had a much easier time than those who did not, who were viewed as being lesser and having no value, facing hard persecution. In almost every family of those who resisted, at least one member died in a concentration camp. When the war was over, the feelings of bitterness ran deep between these two groups and there was constant tension. Finally, one of these, er, finally these two religious groups decided that the situation needed to be healed and resolved. So the leaders from each group got together at a quiet retreat 
And for several days, each person spent time in prayer examining his own heart in light of Christ's commands. Then they came back together. And as the one gentleman asked the other who was telling about this incident, what did you do then? And that man simply replied, we were one. As they confessed their hostility and bitterness to God and yielded to God's control, that group allowed the spirit to create a new spirit of unity among them. Think about it. Such horrible transgressions are unforgivable, and healing and reconciliation in these circumstances would take nothing short of a miracle. Yet in the end, love filled their hearts and resolved their hatred. When love prevails among believers, especially those in times of strong disagreement, it presents to the world an indisputable mark of a true disciple of Christ. We as Christians are called to transcend our worldly ideologies and love all people as children of God first. If we do this, we will have no room to view others as members of a competing tribe needing to be crushed into submission. We will no longer be nudged towards resentment of our neighbors, and we can be those who lead the way for healing and reconciliation in our communities. Some will say that only fools seek re reconciliation in our communities in divisive times as such, and that the actions to do this prove that our beliefs are incoherent and unprincipled. But this is the proof that Christ's transcendent wisdom far exceeds the wisdom of the world, and it has been proven again and again through the leadership of many great people, like Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, the religious leaders of that post-World War II Reconstruction, and countless other examples of leaders where radical love and reconciliation won over divisive wars of ideology in a much more trying times than we are experiencing now. Radical love is imperative if we are to display Christ to the world and if we are to be the hands and voice of God in our own community. Next time we find ourselves arguing with someone, remember Christ's Christ question. What were you arguing about? Let this be a prompt to ourselves to remind us, am I putting my ideology before Christ? We must ask ourselves if we are viewing this person as a child of God, and if we find ourselves viewing them as anything lesser than that, we need to stop arguing and see if as a child of God, they might have something we can learn from them. Let us remember that we are called to be humble servants of Christ, to be those who seek to welcome everyone, those who do not let their ideologies determine how they view others. Let us be the disciples Jesus called us to be for the sake of the gospel and the sake of the world.